Welcome to Four Simple Questions, episode four, series one. My name is Iwan Briok, and in this episode, we bring together the um, professor, visiting professor at Plymouth University, Susan Blackmore, uh, skeptic, author on many books uh, about consciousness, parapsychology, and memes. And non-duality teacher, Jim Newman. And whenever I introduce these dialogues, I notice this imbalance between all the positions and achievements of the scientists compared to the non-duality teachers who really don't have a context other than the function of non-duality teacher. And if there is a pattern that's emerging from these dialogues, maybe it's too early to say, but it feels like between these two participants, there is a kind of event horizon. Uh, and I use those terms, that term in a particular way. It's as if consciousness is like a black hole and the third person scientists are looking at it, studying the, um, the, the circumference of the black hole, while the non-duality teachers have, or well, first person scientists have fallen through the black hole uh, and uh, talking from the other side. So no, useful information actually passes the event horizon and yet there is a gravity. Watch this video and, and see if you agree and, and please subscribe because you know this series is slow moving but we have another uh, dialogue coming out very soon uh, so stick with us. Yeah, what does it mean, meeting? I mean, all it says is a meeting with you. Yes. What's that mean? Maybe that we meet? This, guys. Let's get yeah, <laughs> but are you, I mean, is it like a traditional retreat where you've got half hour sessions and, you know, blah, blah, and, well, and, we're and, rolling on it. and meditation all the time and so on? Or is it mostly like talking like your um, um, YouTube things? Yeah, it's the YouTube things. Yeah. What, for five days? Yeah. Wow. We just sit there and watch the old YouTubes. <laughs> and we were just recently in in Tennessee, and they also have all this meditation and and um, teaching people and stuff. And they have a schedule set up for that sort of um, structure. And we come, and we blow the thing out of the water because the people are really friendly and happy and chat with each other for hours at a time. They don't feel the need to go anywhere, and so their schedule. Because all the other people, you know, spiritual people are very serious. They're really on a path. They're going somewhere. And so they don't talk to each other, not very friendly. So it's easy to get, you know, washing up done 15 minutes after the food is served. With us, washing up, I mean, people aren't even done eating until 30, 45 minutes because they can't get enough time to talk to each other, feel friendly and open. and It's nice. So we're filming. Good. So who wants to from the first envelope? Ladies well, I'm, first? I'm, I'm used to the, um, the, the, the rigid retreat kind of system. I, yeah. In fact, when I first started meditating, I think I was wanting to be cruel to myself. I think there was mm. a lot of, um, oh, I've got to, it's got to be painful and, you know. Oh, yeah. Uh, but, uh, but I absolutely loved it because mm. we went to this uh, old Welsh farmhouse um, in, in mid Wales. No gas, no electricity, no phone signal. Well, there weren't phones in those days, but anyway. Um, and sleeping in a barn with holes in the roof and you know, really cold, and that mm. was all part of it, mm. and, the, and the rigid um, yeah. suffering. structure. Yeah, suffering. Suffering is spiritually really valued. To suffer as a spiritual person, that's progress. And you say that as though you think it's not? Oh, uh, well, there's no, I mean, suffering happens, but there's no necessity, there's no value to suffering. Don't you think, though, that some people need it in some way? And I don't think, those... no, absolutely not. So would you want to, want to, you nope. can't just alleviate all suffering, can nope. you? No, well, um, that, that's not the point. The point is there's no value to it. Mm -hmm. There are many spiritual teachers who would disagree, aren't oh, there? Oh, I know. Yeah. Oh, I think most, if you call them a spiritual teacher, I would say 100% disagree with what I'm saying. Mm. Wow. Anyway, we're meant to be answering I questions. Know. We're not talking about no, actually suffering. No, we shouldn't enjoy suffering ourselves. Is, yeah, we yes, should restrict yeah. ourselves and, and answer some questions, and the important things. And drink plain thing. water and yeah. uh, no, no tea or coffee no. or anything, because that would be that would pleasurable. Be, that's um, right, we wouldn't want to okay. do that, mm. no. Mm. Well, who's going to open the first? I suggest you open the first okay. question. 
does it with a certain ceremonial quietness. Mm. Puts his glasses on. Yeah, very that's serious. right. Very serious. <sighs> yeah, be? yeah. Well, it means something, doesn't it? That's a joke. <laughs> <clears throat> um, so I, I'll ask you the question. Yeah. Okay. Who Fine. are you? <sighs> right. Excellent question. The ultimate koan, I suppose you could say. Mm. That is. Um, my instant thought is there are two questions in there. One is the, well, I'm Sue Blackmore and I've done all these brilliant things and I've, I've really uh, had this life and, you know, all of that. And the other one is, who is this uh, who thinks that she's in here and looking out through the eyes and experiencing this room and all of that? Well, who am I? Right now, I am a table, a strange American man sitting over there, strange. smiling and, well, strange, I only met you, what, an hour ago? Well, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but now I'm something else. Um, I, I think that's one of the very interesting things about about that. I've, I've worked on that as a co on often and mm. often enough. The question to her is letting go of who she was a little while ago. Mm. I, I once did a lecture. It's really really annoying because um, uh, the 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 filming whatever of the of the lecture was done so badly that they missed the beginning of the lecture. But I went up on the stage and I said, you know, hello, I'm I'm Sue Blackmore and whatever. And it, it's, it won't be me who leaves at the end. Mm. And then I talked about the nature of self and stuff. And then at the end, I said, right, th this is another another one who's here now. But of course, it didn't make sense if you see it on, on, right. on YouTube. Right. It's like they, you don't see the beginning. Yeah. But anyway, um, so that, I suppose, came out of a lot of thinking about the nature of self. Mm. And... It's not, in my view, it's not that there's something in that changes, it's that there's, there's change and there's every so often the feeling, like when you ask me that question, who are you, instantly a self pops up. Hmm. But my attitude to that is, this is a construction of the brain. It is a construction that, um, it's an illusion in the sense that it's, self isn't not what it seems to be. Hmm. So I still, I still feel like somebody in there looking out through the eyes a lot of the time. I, I, I can drop that, but it's still a very natural way to be. Mm. Um, and that's what we're beginning to understand in, in neuroscience, mm. how that's constructed, how mm. it's related to the, uh, um, the the body schema in the temporoparietal junction, mm. the attention schema that's much broader in the brain and you know, all of those things. Mm. So yeah, it's not a very good answer, but that's the sort of oh. ways in which my thoughts go. <clears throat> Right. How about you? Yeah. How are you? Well, I, I'd agree with your first point that there's an appearance of, you know, a gym who has a history and a story. And, a what? Uh, a gym? And a, a gym. Gym. A, gym. Oh, a gym. Gym. <laughs> I was J imagining I diamond. I was Aww. imagining diamond. No, we're not going to go spiritual here. No, no. no. <laughs> um, and that that is an illusion. Uh, well, you could say the history of... This body is an appearance. It's just something that seems to mm. be there. Mm. But the identification, the, the individual is, well, here it's been seen to be an illusion. And so to ask, who are you? All that happens here is nothing. There's just nothing. Well, there can't be nothing. You're talking, you're speaking, well, you're no, hearing. No, no, as far as the you goes. Oh, is there, isn't okay. anyone, there isn't anyone here who who knows there's talking happening. There's just simply talking happening. So are you saying that all the time, uh, day and night and so on, that thing there is in that state of not feeling as though there's somebody no. who's talking? No, it's not a state. It's just a lack of, it seems to be a lack of a, a certain self-referential um, experience. So I can in a way remember having that but it's a, it's a, what it is the individual is the experience of being separate from that yeah 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 right um and that you say doesn't... you could remember it yeah so this sounds this is very interesting to me because this is a it's quite a long time ago that i became very familiar with the sense that 
there's this. I mean, whenever I ask myself in meditation or um, like I smoke quite a lot of dope and, you know, it's getting to certain states where it's very easy just to drop that. And it's obvious there's all this and there isn't something else experiencing it. But I would say an awful lot of the time I'm just back in that what's so normal to human beings yeah. of, well, it feels like I'm in here and I'm looking up. Hmm. So those kind of, they're both ways of being here. Yeah. But you're saying that it's only it's a different. faint memory for you of that, that, of that well, kind of, I would <clears throat> say, normal way of being. So my words are going to be wrong in some ways because I'm going to say there was a recognition of something, of what this, you could say, what this is. It's not actually a recognition because the individual, that experience of separation hides let's say, the reality of what this is. It's it, in that it's not a reality. And um, that's confusing. Yeah, it is. It hides the reality, but it's not a reality. No, this isn't a reality. It hides the reality that this isn't, isn't a reality, that this isn't an objectified real reality. That separate experience does that. Well, it's as but real as of, anything. Excuse me. Part of the end of that experience of separation is twofold. One is that it never actually happened there isn't anything outside of that which is everything appearing as this. And the, sorry, the recognition, which makes it seem like it's an objectified, you know, understanding or something outside of everything which is seen. And it's not that. It's seeing, or it's not seeing, it's, um, it becomes obvious that everything appears is that which can't be known appearing as this. And that's the end of the experience of separation. So there isn't anything left that 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 would hold on to or could hold on to the experience that a duality has any reality outside of it just appearing. Well, as what such. about memory and personal memory? It's all it's all that. That's okay. that's the all encompassing um, bit. Is that it's all that which can't be known being this. So what, what effect does this have on the way you live your life? Well, it certainly, um, um, what do you say, um, rids one of spirituality. <laughs> yeah. What are the aspects of spirituality that you would like to be rid of? None. None now. And there weren't, when, when I was a seeker, there were none that I would have wanted to get rid of. I mean, it seemed very but important. But you've just said that. You've just said something about getting rid of spirituality. It so gets, I want to find does. out what you mean. Oh, well, the seeking. Ah, so you're not getting rid of spirituality, really. You're getting rid of something that is has to be seeked and seeked. But that's where that's where that's where spirituality comes from is seeking the experience that the appearance is somehow lacking in some way, which are right for every um, experience of duality, for every experience of being an individual, every body that has that seeks. It's just part and parcel. Some are satisfied with Netflix. Some have to go to the Himalayas to find something else. But every separate experience seeks. And that, of course, doesn't happen here. So are you saying um, that you live your life not seeking anything? Well, it depends what you mean. So mm. this, this had to go find um, Sixth, the, the car rental place. That happened. It had to, you know look for airplane tickets and those sorts of things. Mm -hmm. The separate experience will just intrinsically see meaning and purpose in all those activities. Have the experience that all that what's happening is real. Mat it matters in a very different way than it actually does. And none of that happens. All that sort of activity seems to happen, but it doesn't have that added layer of trying to overcome or find some but special... But it's unfair thing. to say that it doesn't happen. I mean, things happen, there's stuff going on, there's change. Uh, you're, you seem to be getting rid of the baby with the bathwater because oh. you could can get rid of the, the sense that it matters, but you seem to be getting rid of the fact that anything's happening at all. Oh, well, absolutely. That's absolutely right. Because everything is that which can't be known, in a sense... You could say, well, you could call that which can't be known nothing. And if you take that further, then nothing is this. So nothing is what appears to happen. There's nothing really happening. But that's, that's well, in the Buddhist sense, that's form and emptiness, isn't it? Um, or, or, or do you not see it in that terms? 
emptiness here anyway is the absence of the individual. But the absence of the individual isn't the same as this being that which can't be known. There's sort of two aspects no, of it. No. it the absence of the individual reveals that this is that which can't be known, being this. I, I think, I don't want to get too technical about this, but I think form and emptiness is not about that so much. It's about that, I mean, the emptiness of all phenomena is that, you know, uh, we call it a table, but it doesn't have independent existence. But still there's stuff, still in, in, in the world of experience, the, the stuff and the stuff happening and things are changing and so on. Ultimately, they're empty of self-nature. Hmm. But that's different from, from what you're saying. It is, it is, because that's, what you're saying is some intellect, and it's intellectual. It's an understanding of what this is, and what I'm talking about can't actually be known, because in the end, what we're saying, what I'm saying, is that what this is can't be objectified. What's longed for, and that's where seeking, sort of, you know, chases its own tail, is what's longed for isn't actually an object, but the individual, that separate experience, can't do anything but seek an object. So, what about suffering? Well, so pain and all those things still arise. Um, but for me, suffering is seeking. It's that seeking energy that is a very sticky, needy energy that holds on to and mulls over emotions, feelings, thoughts with its construct or idea of what this is supposed to be. Seeking is actually sort of an idea of how the appearance should be and my effort, the individual, the separate experience effort to make it look that way with the idea that at the end, if I ever get it right, I'll be whatever my idea of that is um, fulfilled. It's tricky um, because clearly you were seeking a car and you want to go to sixth and all of that. Mm. So can you actually separate the ordinary? Totally. You can separate the two oh, kinds totally. of seeking. Oh, totally. Well, okay. Well, so, that, that helps so the because appearance, you're still having you're still a normal human being going around <clears throat> trying to achieve things and get here, and obviously, yeah, yeah. So, so there's sort of you could see it as what's happening plus the experience of separation. So, what's happening? It's still everything is the same, and and it's all different at the same time. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's something that very many spiritual teachers would agree with, wouldn't they? Um, oh, oh, but, yeah, maybe, yeah. I, well, I think definitely that yeah. the sort of idea that enlightenment is not like gaining something, everything's actually just the same, but somehow totally different. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. that's a yeah. similar thing. Do you think we ought to have another question? Yeah. yeah. Shall, shall I do yeah. one this time? Yeah. Oh, do you have a favorite color? Oh, mm. purple. Uh, well, you asked. All right, all right. It was a very quick answer. My school well, uniform my was purple, and uh -oh. I always hated it. I went to a really, really horrible, <coughs> cruel, awful girls' Cultured. boarding school. Uh, yeah, that had a certain culture of cruelty yeah. and misery and whatever. Mm. And we were purple. We, uh, we had these dresses called the Purple Horror, mm. and then we had to, because we were brought up to be young ladies mm. who were going to get married and not do anything other than that. Yeah. And... Um, then we had to wear grey socks and a grey skirt in the morning and then have a rest after lunch and then put on our white socks and our whatever else it was and different clothes at the weekend and all purple. <sighs> <laughs> I hope it's a good question. Me too. <laughs> what is it like to be you? Right. Um, well, they, so, so there's a character, Jim, that has... Um, just a certain way of being, you know, genetics, conditioning, that's all here. He, he drives a little bit too fast sometimes. He likes sushi. He's um, not keen on culture or restriction. Um, bit of an anarchist. So that's sort of the expression of... Um, but this question I is what it is like to be you, not yeah. what are you like. No, that's You've true. You've described what you're like. Yeah, yeah. Both as your own reflections on yourself and as I imagine what you're thinking other people would think of you. Oh, he drives a bit fast and oh, I'll give him some sushi. Yeah. But what is it like to be you? And is that even a meaningful question? No, it's not. I guess that's the reason I went into the default of sort of the character of this. I might have gotten to what is it like. Um, yeah, I don't know how to answer that. I mean, you just have to say this is it's like this 
Yep. Well, is it like something? Well, there's so there's emotions and things that happen. There's there's that that's apparently happening. A zoo is apparently happening. A table is apparently happening, and that's that's what it's like. You're picking on little things there. So the question could be interpreted as a more globally. What is it like? Ah, say mindfully. What is it like? You've just picked on little things. Can mm. you say anything about the more or broader experience because you were just narrowing it down into certain answers there well i just uh, there isn't a broader experience of what it's like you probably realize that i'm i'm pushing at this question because it's so fundamental to consciousness studies mm. so it goes back to nagel's uh, famous 1974 paper what is it like to be a bat you know neil degrasse neil degrasse he's somebody yeah. on the internet um, yeah I, yeah I don't, I don't know him personally I've, I, I've met him once yeah and um, I saw something from him recently, and he interjected, interrupted someone and said, well, maybe we're asking the wrong question. Maybe there is no such thing as consciousness. Maybe it's going to turn out to be something completely else. There's no hard question of consciousness. It's the wrong mm, question. Hard problem, you mean. Oh, sorry. The hard question is a different thing altogether. Got it. Got it. Um, there, are, there are two yeah. two things there. Yeah, I, I would think it's Neil deGrasse Tyson, yeah? Yeah, oh, sorry, um, yeah, right. Because uh, that's, that's sort of... The what's, that is exactly what's been seen here, is that it's the wrong question. I uh, agree with that in the sense of um, there are real problems um, with the hard problem. And I've written uh, quite a lot about how to escape from the hard problem. But it's really hard. I mean, non-duality is, if you like, an escape from the hard problem. Because the hard problem is basically the mind-body problem. I mean, it's the mind-body problem, how can there be mental things and physical things? Um, but uh, the hard problem is expressed differently. Um, Dave Chalmers coined the phrase in 1994. Um, and he, he puts it as, how can, how can subjective experiences arise from the objective activities in the brain? There's other ways of putting it, but basically it's that. How does one arise from the other? Now, if you, if you say that consciousness arises from the brain, you're already some kind of dualist mm. because you're saying that it's something separate. Mm. Um, but so that's one way of saying, well, that's obviously wrong. <laughs> um, it doesn't make sense. So there can't be a hard problem, but then it hasn't really helped you to resolve it. Um, but how do you resolve a nonsensical question? Uh, well, it's it, uh, to come back to that might be a nonsense. I'll come back to that in a minute. I, I don't think it, I don't think the mind body problem is a nonsensical problem hmm. because of ordinary experience. Of, but if both are, are, I feel I'm are in nothing here. appearing, hmm? if both are that which can't be known appearing, there isn't actually any um, dichotomy anymore. But then what do we have to find out with all our neuroscience? Um, How the brain what works. is the nearest? Yeah. And then we have to find out what the brain So. That's what takes me personally into illusionism, because I'm one of the illusionists, um, that the nature of self and the nature of consciousness are both illusions in the sense they're not what they seem to be. Mm. So then that diverts you completely from what's going on most of the time in consciousness studies into saying, well, what we need to know about the brain is how it constructs this illusion. Mm. And that's what I want to know. And that is not, we're getting clues all over the place. Mm. But people who are working on, on trying to understand how consciousness arises from the brain, mm. are, a lot of them are doing, um, the most popular method is, is looking for the neural correlates of consciousness. Mm. So people are looking for which bits of the brain or mm. which processes in the brain give rise to this magical thing, mm. rather than looking for, well, how is it that brains like this get Corrupted comes to mind. That's not really mm. what I mean. Uh, but come to experience the world as though there is a self in here who's doing it. Mm. And that consciousness is is a tiny bit and there's all these other unconscious things. Mm. So that's the sort of um, <clears throat> muddle into which consciousness studies has got. But mm. going back to our question, what is it like to be you? Mm. Yeah, what is it like to be you? Um, <clears throat> that depends totally on how something in here chooses to interpret the question. Mm. So I can do what you did and take bits and pieces, but I'm more inclined to just go, and then it's just this. So you can't, anything you say about what it's like misses the point mm. because it's a moment that's then gone. Mm. And there's another one. 
So there isn't an answer to that question, which I think you <laughs> would agree there isn't mm. an answer. Nevertheless, it's really important. See, Nagel said, this is the key to why his paper is so, so famous now. He was going to defeat materialism and totally failed. <laughs> and what's remained from that is him saying, if there is something it is like to be the bat, something for the bat, that's what we mean by a bat being conscious. Hmm. And if there's nothing it's like to be the bat, hmm. nothing for the bat, then that's what we mean by not being conscious. Hmm. So that helps us to know what it is we're trying to find out about. Hmm. That's why it's a useful question. I still think it's a useful yeah. question. But well, then we, in, that condi in that context, this would be completely unconscious. Oh, right. So giving up. Well, no. Giving up the, no. the illusion of the separation. No. Well, I mean, I don't know how far you want to go into that, but you, no one can give up this say, experience of separation. That's just an illusion trying to undermine an illusion. It's just, a, it's just again, it's chasing its own tail. I, I don't understand. Because you were saying, in a lot of what you've been saying so far, you've been implying at least that that illusion is no longer there. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So isn't it appropriate of me to say you've given it up? No, no, because I, no, no one would. No one, no oh, one would. Oh. You, oh, because I'm saying you gave it up. So, yeah, I didn't really. It, oh, it is given up. It, it, is, well, it has been let go. Uh, I mean, what, as long as we're say? talking. What would you say? It, it seemed to have never happened, actually. There were, isn't oh, any separation. But you were also saying So the saying whole experience the of trying to give it up is just within a dream that there is real separation. I get that. But you mm. were saying the sense of separation still arises or something like that? No, not here. You, okay. Did it just disappear one day? Or? Well, you could. It's a funny thing to talk about it disappearing because what you're doing is you're saying that it really happened and yes. that it really changed and something new arose. But it, it's not that something new arose; it's that there never was separation, and so that dream, that in what is imposition on the appearance, was no more. Well, that all sounds very lovely, oh. but in a way, <laughs> yeah, yeah, give me Yeah, but wait a like. second, here comes, here comes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> sounds lovely, bud. but <laughs> there's a definite but there. Um, <laughs> in the ordinary world of talking about these things mm. and what we've been talking about, the kind of illusions that that we have that brains construct. Yeah, that it, it, if you just say, "Well, that never happened," yeah, then that's that's. False in the sense that we believed it, we said it, words were based on it, books were written on it. So in that sense, in the sense that anything happens, in the sense that I can pick up this water and drink it, and that happened, and I can also see that as empty of, you know, whatever, self-nature and so on. Um, didn't it also happen that that human being there is different now and did have illusions as a kid or a teenager or whenever mm. did have the illusions and no mm. longer does <clears throat> you have to parse out the the fact that because everything is that which can't be known there's a there's a, a sense of reality that it seems to have in separation which is part of an illusion that it's not that which can't be known and in as much as it's that which can't be known, this is that. In as much as it is that, nothing actually really happens. Well, I know, but we have to be able to, we are, it's not just that we have to be able to, we are having a conversation. Absolutely. In, <clears throat> in a world which I, I, all those things that you've said can, can still be so, but we talk as though these things matter. This doesn't. And no, absolutely not. Not that it matters. It obviously, I'm a bit of a broken record, but as everything is that which can't be known, it no longer has that need to have any meaning or purpose because there's no one separate seeking anything. So it just, it's freedom happening for I absolutely get that. no reason. I get that, oh, but okay. I'm still trying to get back to huh. this thing that you took me up on, which was when I said that you had let go of mm. that illusion. Mm. Now, just to say, oh, well, that didn't really happen, is to say that nothing really happened and we can't even have a sensible conversation. It seems not to me... About it, not about it really happening, about it, about it seeming to happen. We can talk about that. 
I can I could give you a story of how it seemed to happen, but it doesn't really happen because there isn't anything separate from that which is everything. Okay, let me have the story then of this young gem or ger, or gem gem of diamond. This young gem was <laughs> was born and grew up and so mm. on, and has mm. now become this spiritual teacher. Ooh. Isn't it reasonable? Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Oh, oh, oh no. Okay, you become a. Um, um, a meeting leader. <laughs> <laughs> um, and this, that person who's grown up and changed has now changed. And you say that I'm not allowed to say that he gave up. I'm talking oh, about the whole thing. Oh, gave a, up that illusion. There's, there's no culture here. You're not, it's unrestricted. You can say anything you like. <laughs> it just happens to be not, it, it happens to be misleading that there was any volition, personal volition, oh. that had an effect oh. on the end of the seeker. Ah, ah, which is why I shifted from you gave it up to you let go, and I should go even further and say it disappeared or it is no more or something. Uh, yeah. But you would accept that in the ordinary way of talking, once there was a boy who did have that illusion and now there is a physical human being that doesn't have it. And both, okay. and both of those are this, appearing as those ideas or memories. Yes then this doesn't come from anywhere or go to anywhere. It's all that nothingness or whatever you want to call it, that big champion name, appearing is this. But it appears in very interesting ways. So yeah. uh, there is a danger, I think, in, in what you're saying there that you may not fall into, but people do. Mm. But that makes me ask, well, how can we do science then? I mean, <clears throat> how, how can we find out regularities of the world? It's an extraordinary thing that this world that is world of appearance is actually understandable. Yeah. And how, how do you react to that without just saying, well, everything's not really happening and, and just washing it all away? Well, I think what happens is that the separate experience gets a hold of the idea that everything is nothing appearing and nothing really matters and applies that to its experience of separation and says, why should I endeavor then in the first place if nothing actually matters? But the endeavor doesn't come from the individual in the first place. The individual is just a a, a, a rider. It just sort of goes with what's happening and takes responsibility for it, says, I'm doing it. And it isn't like that, that if there isn't um, that separate experience, if there isn't curiosity or interest or motivation or any of those things. T tell me about that taking responsibility. The, the experience of separation is one that everything is happening to me. Mm -hmm. It's all mine. So a thought is my thought, a feeling is my feeling, a decision is my decision, and even that body over there is my experience of that body. Everything belongs to me. But and I took you to be saying something like, no free will, no no doing, right. no, and so on. That's right. But then That's you said, right. take responsibility. That's and right. And I want to hear That's more the about illusion. that. That's still part of the illusion. Oh, yeah, definitely. That, that I'm interested in this because of an... I want to get back to how can we do science, but never mind. I'm interested in that because... Well, I answered that, and I said, it's a misunderstanding <laughs> that, that this applies to the individual's motivation, that the motivation that appears. The misunderstanding is that it's the individual that does that. It's just there's some... Some bodies are interested in science and make do science, or interested in poetry or painting or anything else and do that. And where there's a separate experience, that experience is, I'm the motivator. That's not true. But I didn't mean oh. we do it. I wasn't talking about that aspect. I mean, why does the universe make sense? This is a question philosophers have asked for a long time. Yeah. How come we, you know, scientists can, that science can happen and neuroscience can happen and we now know all these things and we can talk about them yeah. and we can do experiments to mm. see them. Um, so the world has it is, is an ordered world and, and an interesting and, and investigable world, mm. which seems a rather counter to your what you were saying about it's not really happening. Oh, no, I, I just think the ordered is just nothing appearing ordered. Yeah, okay, that's form and emptiness again in my terms. Anyway, back to the um, taking responsibility. Um, I'm interested in this because of an experience I had a very long time ago. Do you know Reb Anderson? I don't. Um, you know of him? Or not? Nope. He used to run the um, uh, uh, San Francisco Zen Center. Um, a wonderful teacher. I'm, I've been on a few retreats with him a long time ago. Um, and uh, it was, I was back in that farmhouse I was talking about, you know, the really primitive place with the 
endless hours of meditation. And I, and I came to, this is 20, 30 years ago, mm -hmm. I came to a great realization of non-doing mm -hmm. and of um, uh, non-free will. And, and I went to him in a formal Zen interview, you know, mm -hmm. speak mm -hmm. formally and bow to the master mm -hmm. and all these kinds mm -hmm. of stuff, you know. It, he sat there and I was really quite frightened because as people are when they first discover this, yeah. with a feeling, oh God, I might go out and start wrecking the world. I might do terrible things. Mm. You don't, but you know, mm. all sorts of things were, were quite mm. scary. And I said, well, what do you do? You know, what, what do I do when I realize this? And he said, and with, you know, bright Zen eyes mm. and complete presence, you know, he said, take responsibility. Mm. That's why I asked you what you meant by that. Mm. Well, here there isn't anyone to take responsibility. But you used that phrase. Yeah, as part uh, of the illusion. I was explaining or describing part of the illusory experience of separation, that it takes responsibility. We were talking about science and how would science continue if what I'm saying is true. Or, and I sort of took that as where would the motivation come from to, to look into the world or try to delve into and find out what this is. And what I was saying is the illusion takes responsibility for the motivation, but the motivation might still come up if there isn't, even without an illusion. Might not. But. So you wouldn't go along with um, Reb's advice then? Absolutely not. Or you might if it were a, a step of letting go? No, there, not even that? Well, because there you, don't, the, you don't see any progress. You no, don't there see isn't. The, Absolutely. <clears throat> there isn't any progress. Interesting. Yeah. Well, I think it's your turn now. Okay, yep. Blue? Well, especially if you have terrible feelings about blue that you were forced to wear blue clothes at school or anything of that kind. It's my second favorite color. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and now you've got green that comes out of it. Oh, so. no. Um, what is this? <laughs> <laughs> They're all kind of the same question, really, aren't yeah, they? Yeah, that's true. What is this? Um, I haven't a clue. Mm. Because... Um, one thing that really annoys me, um, people always say that I'm a materialist and then I get all these emails saying, you know, you materialists are, you know, I, I, I can't be a materialist because I don't know what matter would be. Mm. Um, so I call myself a you know, neutral monist, meaning I, I'm sure there's only one kind of stuff in this world, but I have no idea what it is. Mm. So what is this? Is that what's the question? Yeah. Well, it, it goes back to what we were saying earlier, which is kind of why it's the same question. I can do what you did, pick on little bits and go, well, this is, mm. you know, whatever. Mm. But then that's not, that's getting right away from what is this, which is the same kind of question as, as who am I or um, uh, what is it like to be me now? Mm. Well, you have a go. Oh, I've got the same issue, except it's, um, it's, it's, it's obviously nothing. So, But it isn't obviously nothing. So that's a really interesting answer. I mean, I can get my teeth into that because some of what you say, I just feel I can't get my teeth into at all. Um, because I can't really disagree because there isn't anything substantial to, mm. to, to dis disagree with. Mm. But it's not nothing. It's this. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and it's, I mean, if I then say it's something, I'm spoiling it, but it's not nothing. Yeah, but this is nothing. So there's this and it's nothing. It's the, that, that's the not two-ness of the whole thing is that it, the, the nothingness and the somethingness are actually the same thing. Well, that's form and emptiness. Um, oh, okay. Okay, the, 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 the Zen understanding is yeah. a bit different from what you were talking about, but it's, it's similar in that respect. Yeah. I mean, in the Heart Sutra, it says um, uh, form is emptiness and emptiness is form. Yeah. Form is precisely emptiness and emptiness is precisely form. Yeah. Yeah. So, so also are sensation, perception, mm. volition, and consciousness. Absolutely. Yeah. There is no eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, mind, no sight, sound, smell, taste, touch, mm. thought. There is, no, anyway, never mind. Uh, mm. That, that's, uh, I mean, the Heart Sutra is very central in, in Zen and mm. in Buddhism And then they general, don't tell you how to do it. Well, that's a very different matter. <laughs> that's a very, very different matter because they would, uh, who are they? Who are they? Um, I mean, well, the I, one that says you should take responsibility. 
Yeah. There I, is no I. Everything is empty form, empty emptiness in form, whatever. Yeah. Um, yeah. Ben, now you should go realize that. You mean that's what they say, that yeah. now you should go and realize yeah. it? And you would say instead of that? That you, it's impossible. Right. Because either you do or you don't, you can't go seeking for it. Well, there is an, I, an I wouldn't do, an I would never want what we're talking about, what, what this is. It would always want, it necessarily wants an object, something it can know, yeah. experience, um, yeah. perceive, something it can add to itself. So, when we ask what is this, I'm trying to do justice to this no. third question. When we ask what is this, there are two people sit here, sat here, <laughs> with this question. Can we say anything about the difference between the kinds of experiences that we're having? I mean, might you say that oh, you're not course. having an experience anyway? Or well, there's no experience, but I mean, there's obviously a different perception. This sees that and that sees this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, And, and that's not nothing, is it? Oh, yes, of course it is. That's, that's Only in the sense we were just talking about, that everything is, is something and nothing. That's right. And it comes out of nowhere and doesn't, I mean, doesn't come really and go. That's right. It just is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Apparently. Well, do you think we should uh, grasp the last one? Yeah, it's your turn. I bet it's, I bet it's basically the same as yeah, the other ones. Yeah, who am I or something. We've had who am I, haven't we? Oh, maybe. Oh, haven't we? Maybe not. Oh. No, it's a bit different. <laughs> well, I've got some power here, haven't I? Ooh, I cannot, I cannot tell you. <laughs> oh, we have a little insight into you, don't we? Why, why is this? Oh, right, meaning and purpose, yeah. Yeah, so there's, um, I think you started off doing two sort of different realities, I can remember that, because I can sort of, I can totally get into that. So the separate experience is that the appearance has meaning and purpose. And the idea for the separate experience is that it, through fulfilling meaning, through fulfilling, you know, through finding and, and fulfilling that meaning and purpose, it'll find endless happiness, that's sort of the thing the idea of it, um, or the experience of it as a separate individual. And, you know, where this comes from, it, it's that um, it's just part of the illusion of separation, that something is really happening. And that there, freedom is truly there being no meaning or purpose. There is no why to what this is. It's actually the question why, the, it's a need to know, hides the freedom that this is. It literally, literally, it's that simple. But you talk like any normal person about um, why did you go and try and get the car from Sixth and why oh, did you absolutely. come and do this? So in that sense, in the way that we talk, yeah. there is a why and there is meaning and purpose. Well, in a specific, you know, what, what would you call that, a context? Mm -hmm. Yeah, but not about this, not about... Okay, so of, let's yeah. go to this then. Okay, why is this? I like this question in a much more fundamental and down-to-earth way. Why? Uh, <laughs> sorry, am I being? I'm being sort of subtly rude. That a little, yeah. To me. <laughs> it's all right. You do it well, all. Maybe I was. <laughs> yeah. Oh, who knows right. what comes out of this thing here? <laughs> Weird things come out of this thing here, and I hear them. Oh, who hears them? Oh dear. Um, is why is the world the way it is? Why mm. is this room the way it is? Why are those trees out there the way they are? That's how I, I'm. One way of looking at this question, mm. and that comes down to evolution. And it comes down to basic structures of a universe that we seem to have. Um, and I'm very firmly in the, okay, it's ultimately nothing, but I'm going to be working in the world in which it appears to be stuff. And I'm back to that question about how come it's a universe in which we can do science and, and understand it. So the way that I think about this being here now is, I suppose it goes back to Mono's chance and necessity. You know, everything came about the way it did because did it have to? Well, there were probably random processes as well. Um, so it's not necessarily deterministic, but the evolutionary process produces mindlessly design out of nowhere hmm. and trees grow the way they do because of the genes and because of the way they adapt to the, you know, and I find this just wonderful. Hmm. Um, I, I find it wonderful in the sense that I suppose because I like, I like illusions and the illusion of deliberate design, the illusion that gives rise to the belief in God, the creator, mm. the idea that somehow we're so clever that we design things like, you know, well, 
I'm looking around for something I designed. Oh, all the paintings over there. I painted all of them. Mm. Um, so I, I designed them. But of course, I didn't really. They they happened. <laughs> mm. it, it's, it's how this thing feels about it. Mm. Um, but all of that uh, that illusion leads people into believing in, in God, the creator, into believing that we couldn't have this. This wouldn't all happen um, without there being minds doing things. And that gives a sort of an idea of the power of consciousness, the power to design things to, you know, yeah. all of which I think is is wrong. Everything mm. is just coming about because it does. Mm. And I've had lots of fights with, um, not fights, but, you know, big arguments, um, in usually in, in spiritual con contexts. You know, we have a consciousness uh, group in Totnes and... Um, that very often people that kind of really hate the things I'm saying. And one of the things that I'll say endlessly is it's just stuff happening. Mm. And in a way that fits with mm. a lot of what you've been saying. Mm. It's just stuff happening. Mm. Get used to it. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's the hard bit. <laughs> mm. It's getting used to it. Um, and when I say it's just stuff happening, that's coming, a lot of that is coming from evolutionary science and, and, and theory that uh, amazing things just come about, but it's also coming from the recognition of free will being an illusion, of the, the illusions of, of what we, from our own, you know, my consciousness is doing. And But you see, I would say letting go of that. You'd say there's no letting go because it's always been there, but I would say uh, that it has to be let go of. And the way I've let, the science has helped me to let go by this phrase, it's just stuff happening. Well, the reason I don't agree with letting go is because the individual wouldn't. Mm, if it, yeah, if because it, the individual is grasping. Oh, absolutely. And if it if it would, it would be just another effort to to um, to become to have a better experience. Mm. It mm. wouldn't. It doesn't. It doesn't want what I'm talking about. It can't because it's. It, there's nothing in it for it. There's just nothing in it. It's worthless, valueless. What about this? Uh, common idea that um, in, in talking about enlightenment, people say <clears throat> um, uh, you, you can't get it. There's nothing you can do to get it, but you can do things that, that make it more likely to happen. Mm. Or accident enlightenment is an accident. Yes, exactly. exactly. <laughs> That's the word I'm, thank you. That's what I was grasping at. Mm. You know, it, it's, it's an accident, but you can make yourself more accident prone. Mm. Do you not even agree no. with that? Well, the, the, that, the idea would be that there's a relationship between the separate experience and that which can't be known. And there isn't that relationship just doesn't, there's no separation like that. Everything is already that. But if what is bringing about the separation is a complex illusion constructed by a brain, yeah. doesn't work on loosening that construction, help the, 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 it to disappear? No, the, the illusion it looks for an object. It looks for something it can experience and know. It can't do anything else but do that. But it, and so all of its activities just confirm the experience of separation and the idea that it has free will and choice in order to find what it feels is missing or what's longed for. And I get that. The, there isn't that relationship because there isn't any separation. I get that, and yet my own <clears throat> long, long-term experience of meditation and knowing a lot of people mm. um, through retreats and whatever, is that with practice, with practicing mindfulness, with daily meditation, suddenly a different way of being sort of pops up? Well, I think this, uh, let's call it a recognition, happens all the time, and even meditation can't stop it. <laughs> oh, I mean, you know. Well, that you know, I could see the I could see the little grin on your face coming as you knew uh, that, that, that what you were going to say uh, would make yourself laugh. Um, <laughs> I'm not so sure about me. Um, and I think it's very unkind in a way, although it's very funny. Um, it because you're implying that it could make things worse. And I think to some extent there, there is some truth in that. There are well, people... we were talking before about suffering being one of the golden orbs of spirituality. It's something to be um, uh, worshipped. 
there's some value in suffering. I think that's a different thing. I, oh. I think what you were coming to hear more is is about if you do a lot of meditation and you do a lot of hard work about it, you know, and it is a huge effort to make yourself do it every day and mm. all of that kind of mm. stuff, you would rule that out completely as being valuable. Um, yes. And the suffering might be a part of it, but I'm talking more generally right. about this. Whereas I think people can go very badly astray. It's called, what's it called? Spiritual bypassing. No, that's something else. But anyway, that um, spiritual materialism, grasp, no, yeah. grasping, grasping these, oh, now I've done, and, you know, I'm mm. prone to that. I mm. think, mm, I've been meditating every day mm. for 40 years, mm. you know. Um, but if I hadn't been meditating um, every day for 40 years, uh, this thing here would be a different person. Mm. Now, that I, I think that can go in many directions. And very often people do grasp onto it and do think about achievement. And my Zen teacher, John Crook, was always kind of telling me about that. You know, and that's not the way. Mm. <laughs> Don't, you know, you're trying too hard. You know, And it's horrible to be told you're trying too hard when you're really trying. <laughs> but, you know, yeah. that can be a, a, a stage that some people have to go through. So I don't think there are stages, but I'm certainly not saying that there's anything wrong with any activity. All I'm saying is, or, or right. Of course, meditation has all sorts of effects on the brain and the body and all these other things, which are beneficial. Absolutely. But that doesn't, it will not lead to what is already. Yeah. Nothing can. Yes. So it isn't, it isn't undermining it. It is undermining the idea, what I said about meditation can't stop it from happening, that there is a relationship between an activity of the individual and freedom. So you teach all this you go and have your meetings and you talk and everything. Can you tell me something about the effect this has on the people who come to your groups? Well, I think what, you know, I talked about the meeting I had in Tazewell in, in, in Tennessee, how our group seemed to be a little bit different from the other groups who were trying to find something. Um, that there's an ease or a, a freedom, I guess I would say. And for me, it, that has something to do with it not being a teaching. There is no imposition whatsoever in the meetings on the individual to become anything because it's because it just, you know, it correlates completely with what we're what I've been saying. And that is there is no relationship between the experience of the individual and freedom. The experience of the individual is freedom being the experience that something needs to happen. But I'm asking this in a rather this is a rather cruder question than I think the way you're interpreting it because what comes to mind is some kinds of teachers and retreats and so on can be positively harmful. There's, mm. There can be a lot of abuse going on, um, uh, abuse of power, mm. all kinds of power over things. And people can become uh, distressed. Um, they can become really disturbed sometimes with mm. really bad teachers and bad situations. Yeah. Or you have ones where people will go on with the same teacher for years and years and years and years, mm. never really um, uh, understanding anything or it never, never really changing mm. and still stuck there. Mm. And you can have others where people really do, I would say, move on, mm. let go of stuff mm. and become more at ease um, with themselves mm. and, and with all the things that, that causes suffering. And I'm trying to wonder what happens well, to the people who, do you have followers who, who you know, so fact, outside, what happens to them? Outside of the abuse of power bit, I think all those things that you mentioned happen in, in the meetings. All of that can happen. Um, what I do find is it, it's a very hard um, message to follow as, mm. as like something to hang on to because it just, it, it just gives nothing. It gives nothing. So some are inspired by it, and I think listen to it for quite a while. Many come and go quickly because it doesn't give anything to them. I think that's one of the beautiful things about it is there's nothing to hang on to. It makes it absolutely clear that there's nothing to hold on to. But the ones who go with it, you're, you've been saying that there is no progress, whatever, but in a way that's implicit in what you were just saying, that there is, that some of these people get something from it, you said? Oh, absolutely. Well, I mean, in that separate experience, the experience is a process. That It always is a process of things getting better or worse. There is no process, just as, just as everything is already empty. But 
yeah, people have di- go through different processes and whatever else that seems to happen. Yeah, but you you've but there said not... there's better and worse. Excuse now, me? you have used the words better and worse. Yeah. Things get better and worse. Yeah, that's the and I would of the expect individual. you to. Okay, so that's <clears throat> you would cope with that by saying, well, that's when there is an individual there, or it was a self there. I wouldn't say an individual's this. I would say, but the, okay. the self, there's a mm. self there for whom it's better or worse. Yeah, but you're really saying that that's. Part so, of the illusion. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, I, I would say the same, but I'm I'm having trouble here because you're saying there is nothing to be gained because there never was, because there never was a separation. But you, in your life and your work, you are dealing with real people for whom things can be better or worse. They can mm. learn more or they're not. They mm. are going through a process. Well, they're not real, but anyway. Well, like, yeah, you can say that, but you can say that about everything. Yeah, but right. they are going through a process, the sum of whom will come to see the world without this darkness of the self getting in the way of everything, and some won't. Now, mm. isn't that to say there is some kind of progress, some kind of learning, some kind of change? Well, in the same way that this, uh, I say that it didn't happen here, it doesn't happen there. There already aren't individuals. It's an illusion that there's something separate. But in the ordinary the, world, they've but changed. The, but there aren't, there aren't actually two realities. It truly is everything or nothing appearing as this. It is that way. Of course, the, as we've been saying quite the whole time, there is this uh, added on experience of the illusory experience of the individual. And that added on experience feels like things are process in a process it, it has a life which it's responsible for and it's working through a process mm. and the is. end of that isn't a real thing because there never was an individual working through anything mm. there isn't anything really happening oh now you end with a beatific smile <laughs> <laughs> i mean i say end because Aww. it kind of you put that smile on is in this kind of nice way that it Felt like an ending. So do you think we should we should call this the ending of our four questions? Okay, yeah, great. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, lovely. Thank well, you. Well, thank you. Thank you mm. very much, you non-existent mm. person in a... <laughs> <laughs> non-existent... No, you body sitting mm. here. Um, thank you very much. Thank you.